So please join me as we take a look at this wonderful ship known today as the Vasa. Let's explore how she was built and what led to the disaster on the 10th of August and see what lessons still apply today, mostly in terms of project management and leadership. King Adolphus was born in 1594 and in 1611 he became the king. He was quite educated and reformed the Swedish government, providing a more strong central government with administrative districts, but best known for his military innovations and combined arms. He combined infantry, artillery, and cavalry into the modern fighting force used across the world today. He was uh, well studied by Napoleon, von Clausewitz, and even Patton. Here is a model of the shipyard where it was built in Stockholm. They did traditional Swedish building techniques, laid the keel, laid the floor, and then started building up the sides. Once the sides were done, it was floated off, and then the inside and the tops were built separately. The Vasa Museum has just incredible displays. We'll talk about more about the museum in just a little bit. The original builder died in 1627, leaving the project to his widow who ran the boatyard and his assistant to finish the ship. Unfortunately, he failed to leave any plans. Here we're taking a look at a 1 10th scale model of the Vasa as it was completed with, after painstaking research, the original colors that were on the ship. She was completed in 1628. The Vasa is 226 feet long and displaced 1,300 tons. She is 39 feet wide, uh, that's mostly across the top, and her width at the water line is about 31 feet. She is 170 feet tall from the bottom to the top sail. And as you can see, she was finished with two rows of cannon decks, which was an innovation for the time. Additionally, she was adorned with over 700 wood carvings. The most ornate carvings were on the stern, and that is what was really known as a statement of power. It was a statement of Sweden's power and the king's God-given right to rule. And we're going to talk more about each of these, or many of them, in just a moment. But first, let's view of the inside of the Vasa. Again, the museum has a wonderful scale model there, showing the five decks and everything that goes there. Note at the bottom, there's a uh, narrow space that contains 120 tons of stone ballast. Again, we'll be talking about that in just a bit. The museum has two great displays. One is of the great cabin, which is where the senior officers would gather. Kind of like the day room, probably take their meals here as well. But what an ornate room for a ship. The upper gun deck, they also have a full-scale display of that. One thing to note is I'm about six foot one and I could walk right through here without stooping. Each cannon carriage weighed over 3,600 pounds. That's the weight of a Mercedes sedan. And when she sailed, she had 48 of them. Now, let's take a look at what keeps the ship afloat. You have the buoyancy, which is the force of the weight of the water that's displaced, that's what's holding it up, and gravity is the weight of the ship and everything on it, that's pushing it down. As long as uh, the center of gravity and the buoyancy are vertical, everything is good. But if it starts to list, well, then it gets a little bit of trouble. We follow that center of gravity line through the ship and where it meets the buoyancy force, that's called the metacenter. As long as the metacenter is higher than the center of gravity, then the ship will right itself. Now, if the center of gravity goes a little bit higher, 
Well, then we do that same meta center and now it is below the center of gravity. That can cause a problem. Before we get into what exactly caused the Vasa to sink, let's look at the Vasa as a symbol of power for Sweden and the king. This was going to be the king's flagship vessel as he conducted his war with Poland. The museum has wonderful displays where they have life-size recreations of many of the carvings we're going to take a look at. But let's go ahead and start at the front. At the front, what we see is the lion figurehead that is over 10 feet long, made of linden wood, and it was originally gilded in gold. What an amazing sight that must have been. Just uh, behind the lion, on each side, we are going to see 20 carved statues of Roman emperors. Rome and Greek mythology were great players in the time and they were a great symbol of power. And here's an example of one of the Roman emperors that they have on display there. Moving on back, we now have a Roman warrior. Just look at the beautiful carving of that. Notice the symbolism. There's a dog chewing on a lion's ear. Hey, that's all part of the symbolism that is used throughout the ship. Now, this is particularly funny. That is the backside of a Polish nobleman. He is hiding, and this symbolizes someone who is going traditional punishment for spreading false rumors. In this case, most likely, it is in direct regards to King Sigmund, and perhaps him claiming the right to the Swedish throne instead of King Adolphus. Funny thing is, the only place you can see his face is if you happen to be sitting on the toilet of the Vasa. Moving on towards the back, we can see some galleries and they show a gun port here. And now we can look down on it. The, the museum is a wonderful place. The, the incredible job they do explaining everything is fantastic. Again, we're looking at the galleries. They weren't very practical for anything other than adornment and adding some width and weight. And we're going to talk about all the weight that these 700 carvings add in a little bit. But for now, let's just admire them and the state of preservation that we're seeing on something that is very nearly 400 years old. Okay, some of the carvings, sea creatures, half person, half fish, and you can see them there. They almost look like mermaids. And again, they have recreations here in what they believe is the original paint scheme. Now let's take a look at some of the carvings below the galleries. And as you can see, there are quite a few there as well. And here we start seeing um, the real display of trying to show that the king was the rightful and God-driven heir to the throne. Here's Gideon's warrior. Uh, this is Gideon, biblical reference to the king's God protection of Sweden. Next down there, we have a northern wild man, kind of similar to Hercules of Greek mythology, and it is a symbol of the king's strength and power. And now on to the stern itself. Everything you see that is in the darker wood is original to the Vasa. Lighter wood was used specifically so that you could tell what was added later as a recreation. 98% of the ship is original. Just incredible. First thing we're going to take a look at is the Vasa coat of arms. That is a family coat of arms right there. Uh, the center of it is a wreath of wheat, which is the symbol of the Vasa family. Next to it, you have some cherubs holding it up. Again, it is a symbolism of the divine right of the king to rule. You start getting the sense that he's a little insecure about his uh, cousin, King Sigismund, who his father dethroned. Now, standing to the side of the Vasa family shield are some of the knights representing the king's ancestors. Again, a subtle hint as to his right to rule. As we move up the ship, we see something that really is more comical in nature than having any great symbolism, and these are called grotesques. Just fun little faces. Now, 
Moving on up, we are going to take a look at the National Coat of Arms of Sweden. And here's a good example on the right where you can see the lighter colored wood which represents a recreation. Everything else is original. Above that you can see the letters G-A-R-S. Um, that's a Greek abbreviation for uh, Gustav Adolf, King of Sweden. Just above them are 11 busts and th that's really fascinating because those represent the four classes of people that were established in Sweden at the time. The peasants, the burghers, which were the merchant men, nobles, and clergy. I think it's just fantastic that he highlighted them on the back of his ship. As we get to the top, we can see a young Adolphus being crowned by griffins. Griffins are half eagle, half lion, mythical beasts that represent the protectors of royalty. Now, we're going to take a look down at the bottom, kind of see, you know, symbolically what is holding all of this up. Again, beautiful carvings, but what are they carvings of? Let's take a look. Over on the left, we're going to see Hercules, and we all know the story of Hercules. And here we are. Um, it's a symbol of the king's strength and statesmanship. Over in the center, we are going to see King David. Again, a reference to the king's divine right to rule and that he has the wisdom and strength of King David behind him. And there is a recreation of the King David statue. So colorful, just, just incredible. Let's just enjoy another look of Vasa. So now let's get back into what happened. Where we last left this was if the center of gravity went too high and it started to list what was known as crank at the time, um, the meta center went low. And as we said, that was trouble. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the ship was doomed just because of that. However, they had the gun port doors open because they wanted to fire a salute as they went off on their inaugural voyage. And as it listed, the gun port filled with water, taking away the buoyancy. Center of gravity was still in the center, so amazingly, the Vasa sank, and it sank vertical. And that is where it remained for 333 years. But before we discuss why, we can't forget that 30 people died on the Vasa, including Johan. And these are forensic recreations based upon actual skulls that were found on the ship. Here's Philip. He was believed to be about 30 years old. And another one, Gustav. He was 40 to 45, showing signs of hard work throughout his life. Again, fascinating museum. You'll also see at the museum that the first salvage attempts of the Vasa began in 1663. And that was when they used a new technique called a diving bell. Lead platform at the bottom, uh, I believe that's copper welded together, and a person would stand on the bottom, uh, air would be trapped in the bell itself, and then they would be lowered to the ship. They took off the deck planks and attached a rope to the cannons, and I believe they brought up all but two of the cannons. And here you see one of the original cannons. Then in the 1950s, more modern techniques were used once it was rediscovered. And through a series of dives, divers from the Swedish Navy dug holes underneath the ship, six of them, and then fed very strong steel cables underneath. And over a period of two years, from 57 to 59, it inched its way up out of the water and a little bit at a time where they could plug the holes, plug the stern, plug the bow. And then in 1961, they raised it to the surface for the first time since it sank in 1628, 333 years. Wonderful museum, tremendous displays that they have there. So finally, why did the Vasa sink? We're going to look at this from three perspectives. First is physics. The second is management, something now called the Vasa syndrome. And I'm going to add poor leadership.
Physics is the most obvious reason why, and it was expressed best by the ship's master a month after it sank. The ship is narrow in the bottom and has no belly. That was at the inquest a month later as to why it sank. Basically, he's saying that the ship is too narrow in the bottom and didn't have enough room to hold enough ballast for the the weight that was on it and how high it was. The center of gravity was just plain too high for the ballast space. It was a poor design. It was narrow and shallow, and they used excessive timber sizes, which added extra weight and reduced space. The upper gun deck, as we talked about, was over six feet tall. It was just too high and too well built. Plus all, those, all that ornamentation we talked about, that was all put on high. In short, the center of gravity was just too high. Now let's take a look at what's come known as the Wasa Syndrome. This was from a paper that was published in the Academy of Management in 2001. It's a good read. You ought to see it. It came up with about seven highlights. Lack of external learning. Basically, don't imitate ideas unless you understand them. The king had heard that Denmark was building a two-deck gunship, so he wanted one. Goal confusion. Hey, do you want this to be a powerful, stable warship or a symbol of your power? Don't be obsessed with speed. And feedback system failure. Hey, if people are telling you you might have a problem, make sure you listen. Communication barriers, obviously, between the construction workers, the owners of the yard, the king, and those in between. Poor organizational memory, i.e. no plans. And top management meddling, don't micromanage. Those are the 21st century uh, lessons that were published and known as the Vasa Central. As for my opinion, based upon my career in Army Systems Engineering, I'm going to Blame it on leadership. The two we're talking about, King Adolphus himself and his representative on site, Vice Admiral Fleming. The king was well educated. He delegated responsibility. He led from the front, but he was impatient to get support for the war. And he demanded that it be done by July 25th, 1628, or those responsible would face the king's disgrace. Not good. Vice Admiral Fleming. He was the uh, deputy to the Admiral of the Realm, the King's brother, in charge of Navy procurement, and the guy between the King and the shipyard himself. But did he know the Vasa was doomed? Should he have known? Well, in the summer of 1628, the captain of the ship reported that the Vasa was crank, meaning it wasn't stable. The captain had 30 men run back and forth to test the stability. On the first run, she healed one plank, second, two planks, and on the third she healed three planks, at which time Admiral Fleming ordered the test stop for fear that the Vasa would capsize. All right, so he knew it was unstable. Well, what did he do? Well, he lamented that the king wasn't there to see it. So apparently he was unwilling to tell the king the truth. So next they talked about ballast. The captain said they could fill it to the gun ports and it would still sink. Vice Admiral Fleming replied, well, the master shipwright has built good ships before, so don't worry about it. And this was after he personally stopping the test because he feared it would capsize. Nobody was notified. Vice Admiral Fleming was not on the Vasa when it sailed. But I tell you who was. And that was Philip, Gustav, and Johann, and 27 others with them who died. The king died on 6 November 1632, leading a cavalry charge in the Battle of Lutzen, Germany. Admiral Fleming died on the 27th of July 1644, killed in action. There you have it. That's the story of the Vasa. Now let's talk about the museum for a moment. This is probably the finest museum in the world I have ever visited. Yes, it's dedicated to one thing, which perhaps gives them the advantage that they can cover it thoroughly. It is well explained in English, as well as in Swedish and other languages. And you walk in, and it's just a magnificent sight. It takes your breath away to see this ship. Make sure you take a look at the film, plan your day around when you can get there in your own language, and then take a look at this seven floor plan museum. Plan to spend an afternoon, a morning, or a whole day there. It is well worth it. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this, got something out of it. Um, if you did, please give it a like, and thanks for watching. As always, I am enjoying retirement.